So as I said, I am uh, Lindsay Naradka, uh, and I am the Sustainability Manager for the City of Boca Raton. So uh, what I'm going to talk about tonight is something that's a little bit outside of my kind of normal um, uh, field, field of work. We have a sustainability office, like I said, since 2018. And in 2019, we passed our the city's first sustainability action plan. Uh, and that action plan contains goals and targets um, related to uh, you know, reducing greenhouse gas emissions and adapting to climate change. And so I'm really excited tonight to get to talk uh, about something that I've been learning a lot about recently, but it, which is a little outside of my normal sort of city scope, which is uh, how to eat a climate diet. Now, um, I want to just take a quick moment to kind of frame uh, what I'm going to be talking about tonight, particularly with Bill and Julie here. I just want to acknowledge that there are many of us who have a lot of choices uh, over what uh, our diet looks like. Um, and globally and in our community as well, there are many people who have less of a choice. So I'm going to be talking a lot about individual um, decisions that we can make to, to have a more environmentally friendly diet. And I'm really excited that my co-presenters here are going to be able to talk about the things that we can do to ensure um, a, a healthy and sustainable diet for all members of our community as well. So I just wanted to frame that really quickly. Um, I'm also going to assume that because those of you who are here signed up for a webinar titled How to Eat a Climate Diet, that you have uh, at least a pretty basic understanding of what climate change is and why we're interested in addressing it. Um, but just so we're all on the same page, I want to take a few minutes and just go over the very basics. Uh, so just very basically, uh, in the Earth's atmosphere are gases called greenhouse gases, and they create something called a greenhouse effect, which is called a greenhouse effect because it works much the same way that a greenhouse for growing plants does. Visible light can pass right through these gases, but when it's re-radiated back as heat, the heat hits and bounces off those gases in the atmosphere. Some of that heat bounces back down, and it creates kind of this blanket effect over, over the planet that we call the greenhouse effect. Now, the greenhouse effect is really important. Uh, it's the reason that we have liquid water on the planet and therefore life. However, the more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, the more of the heat uh, bounces back down and gets trapped and the atmosphere warms. Uh, this causes shifts in our climate systems. And the primary reason that we've seen increases in greenhouse gases in our atmosphere over the last century, century and a half, have been largely things that have been driven by human activities such as burning fossil fuels or land use change. And then consequences of that warmer atmosphere and that changing climate are things such as higher sea levels, stronger storms, more extreme heat, things that significantly impact us um, here in uh, Boca Raton and South Florida. So the city does recognize that we uh, are in a location which is vulnerable to the threats of climate change. Uh, and for that reason, we have um, formed a partnership with uh, other local municipalities, six other cities and the county, um, uh, this organization called the Coastal Resilience Partnership. And as part of the Coastal Resilience Partnership, we are working with a consultant group to create a regional climate change vulnerability assessment. The vulnerability assessment is looking at these 12 climate threats, uh, which are, are on the screen on the left and assessing uh, the assets within the community in order to identify the, the, the level of threat and potential adaptation actions um, over the next uh, few decades. So you can follow the progress of that uh, project on the, um, the link here, coastalresiliencepartnership.org, uh, takes you to the county website, which has updates about the project. We will be putting out a survey for public input um, within the next week or so, and then in early November, we will also be having a public input session, uh, probably a webinar uh, like this, um, where you can come learn more about the project and provide some, some input to it as well. So we do know that we have um, uh, changes that are happening in the community uh, because of climate change and will continue to in the future. And we need to make plans uh, to adapt to those changes. But it's also important to recognize that reducing greenhouse gas emissions is helping to reduce the, the drivers of this change. And the more that we can accomplish doing that, then the less we'll have to adapt to in the future and the easier it will be to adapt. 
So in recognition of that, the city as part of the Sustainability Action Plan has also um, just released its first greenhouse gas inventory uh, for the year 2018. Um, and this inventory is just going to create a baseline from which we can measure progress towards some of our um, emission reduction goals and, and see the effectiveness of some of the actions that we are taking to mitigate climate change as we also work to adapt to it. So as we would expect within the city, looking at a municipal greenhouse gas inventory, which is considering all the emissions that are uh, from within the boundaries of, of the city uh, itself, these emissions fall into kind of three main buckets. Uh, we have our transportation emissions, our uh, commercial energy, and our residential energy. And you may notice we're talking about diet tonight, but diet isn't one of these wedges. Um, and that's because these munis municipal inventories don't take into account emissions related to like consumption um, practices that happen within the city, but where the emissions are actually created outside of city limits. For that, we need to take a bit of a broader look and if we look at global greenhouse gas emissions, uh, we see that almost a quarter, we still see some of these same buckets that we see in the, in the city inventory, the electricity, the transportation, the buildings, uh, but we also see that almost a, a full quarter of global emissions come from agriculture, forestry, and land use. And so by taking this broader view at globally where the emissions are coming from, we can start to see that there is the opportunity for our uh, individual choices, particularly around diet, to have have an impact on global emissions. So over the last few years, um, we have been uh, studying and asking, look, what are the things that we as individuals can do that can help make a difference um, for climate? And so a lot of these individualized actions, there's things that need to happen, you know, at a, at a bigger scale, at an international uh, or federal level, but as individuals, what can we do that can make a difference? And so looking at some of these individual actions and going from lower impact to higher impact. Um, another thing that's been looked at as well is how good we are as individuals at then assessing our own carbon footprints. And as it turns out, we're not particularly good at knowing what our own uh, carbon footprint is or which actions that we're taking that are significantly reducing our carbon footprint. We tend to overestimate the importance of actions with relatively lower climate impacts. Um, a lot of things that have other benefits other than climate that we absolutely should be doing, uh, like recycling is listed here, but which are relatively low as a climate action. And we underestimate the importance of actions with higher climate impacts, things like taking one less, um, one less flight in a year or eating a plant-based diet, which is what we're going to be looking at tonight. Um, food is such an important way that we interact with our environment and so much so that Project Drawdown, uh, which is a project that looks at existing solutions to climate change uh, based on existing and scalable and affordable technologies and kind of ranks them by effectiveness. Um, project Drawdown in its top 10 actions has three which are related to food and two of them are actions that we as individuals can have uh, some sort of impact on. Um, and the top five are reduce food waste and eat a plant-rich diet. So Project Drawdown, I like to always mention this because it's really a, a very optimistic project when you think about it. It's all the ways that we already have to not just reduce our, our greenhouse gas emissions, but to begin to draw carbon back down out of the atmosphere um, to stave off some of the worst impacts of, of climate change. And you can find out more about it at uh, uh, projectdrawdown.org or drawdown.org. Um, and also the, the, uh, it was originally published as a book, which you can find at the Boca Raton Library. So what I'm gonna talk about it, pardon the pun, but the meat of the presentation is just some very basic things that we as individuals can do to reduce the climate impact of our diet. And it's gonna, I'm gonna focus on three things, which is eat more plants, um, eat less climate intensive meat, and to waste less food. So in eat more plants, um, there's a lot of reasons why we should do this. For one, uh, plant-based diets are, are healthier. The benefits of eating a, a very plant-rich diet um, have been well known for a really long time. Uh, we looked when we saw those global emissions, that, uh, that orange wedge, that quarter of the global emissions were from agriculture and land use change and 14.5% uh, of emissions, so a rather big chunk of that wedge, um, come directly from livestock. 
um, a study released actually this month uh, looked at the impact that would happen if we do reduce meat consumption and some of that land that's used for agriculture can go back to being a um, uh, whatever it was before, whether that's forest or wetlands, a highly productive ecosystem, what that would mean for carbon stored in the atmosphere. So what that study uh, is proposing is that by reducing meat consumption, so global meat consumption reduction, um, the land freed up by that could absorb the equivalent of nine to 16 years worth of emissions. Um, and this is significant because it's not just reducing the emissions that are related to, um, to animal agriculture, but also beginning to restore those ecosystems which can take carbon back out of the atmosphere. And one thing that I want to point out is that we're saying eat more plants. We're not necessarily saying eat no meat. Um, and there is a study done um, by Yale, their Climate Communication Center uh, on climate change in the American diet. And they did surveys and asked people all sorts of questions about, about their diet, particularly relative to climate impact. And what this study found is only 4% of Americans claim to be either vegetarian or vegan, but 94% are willing to eat more fruits and vegetables. So we can certainly get a lot of impact by convincing everyone to reduce a little bit of consumption than, uh, than a few people to completely eliminate um, uh, meat consumption. It's something we do, sorry if you can hear my kids in the background. Um, it's something we do when we talk about uh, waste reduction. You know, uh, the city does um, events around Plastic Free July and things where we talk about the zero waste movement. And one of the things that we say is we don't need a handful of people to have a year's worth of trash kept in a mason jar. What we need is for everyone to do a little bit and reduce a little bit. And it's the same here. Um, another really interesting study over the last few years uh, was this Eat Lancet study is kind of the, the name of it. And what they did was they took uh, sort of what is, is a climate sustainable diet and then they looked at the nutritional requirements of a global population of what's projected to be as much as 10 billion by 2050 and decided, well, what uh, sort of diet can be sustained by the environment, but also which will sustain the human population. Um, and so the diet they're proposing looks, uh, would have your plates look a little bit like this, where about half of it is fruits and vegetables um, and big chunks of the rest also coming from plant-based plant sources, whole grains, plant source protein, um, but also allowing for some meat and dairy consumption um, as well within that, which brings us to kind of part two, which is eat less climate intensive meat. So uh, not all meat is created equal, not all um, uh, meat production is created equal. Uh, and so even by just choosing different animal uh, sources of protein, we can reduce our, our climate um, impact. And the takeaway from sort of all the different things that measure this is, uh, you know, eat less beef, eat more chicken. I feel like those billboards, eat more chicken. Um, <laughs> but uh, some of the interesting things that we can see here, this World Resources Institute protein scorecard, uh, one of the things, the blue bars on the bottom, show that Americans in particular, we tend to eat more protein than we really nutritionally need. Uh, and so very simply, we can take some of the, you know, some of those ounces of protein, of animal protein out and replace it with um, calories from, from fruits and vegetables uh, without even having to really uh, drastically change our diet. Um, and another thing from the Yale study is they found that one barrier to plant-based diet um, adoption is that about half of Americans think that a plant-based diet is more expensive. Uh, but we also see when ranking the climate impact on the right here um, and adding those kind of price indicators on, on the far side as well, that there are a lot of lower impact or plant-based proteins, uh, which are also uh, affordable. Uh, so this is another study that came out in 2018 that looked at almost 40,000 different farms and uh, assessed different environmental indicators to sort of kind of come up with a ranking uh, for, you know, different, different meats and different protein sources. And this image is from an interactive article on um, NewYorkTimes.com that uh, really inspired me to learn more about this. And I encourage you also to go take a look through this. Um, it's really graphically interesting um, interactive thing that talks about the climate impact of diet. Um, but again, the ranking really works out to beef having the highest impact, uh, plant-based sources of protein, lower impacts with things like pork and poultry and eggs and cheeses kind of in the middle. 
Uh, it is important to say that, you know, not, not all, um, not all cows are, are equal, I guess I could say, um, you know, there's a lot of differences in agricultural practices um, around the world. And so there are ways to continue to, to eat um, beef that is more sustainable and easier on the climate, you know, locally sourced, grass fed sort of, uh, sort of things. Um, think about, you know, where the, the, the cattle are raised and what that might be replacing. So how do we do this? If we need to eat more plants or eat less climate intensive meat, um, what, are, what are the things that can get us um, or get other people to start adopting some of these changes into their diet? And I think the really, the, the top most important thing is to decide what is your motivation going to be? If you're going to make a lasting sustainable change, then there has to be something that gives you a reason to do that. And there's lots of different motivations for this from um, health, to uh, concern about the environment, to even ethics about, um, about uh, consuming animals. Uh, it's a very personal decision um, and you need to find what really motivates you personally to, to do it. Uh, the second thing, and again, to go back to that Yale study, another barrier they found to adopting plant-based diets is that, um, uh, again, around half of Americans uh, felt that a plant-based diet wouldn't taste as good. Uh, and so it's really an opportunity, too, to look up more recipes, um, play with different flavors, try different spices, and learn, um, learn, how, to, learn how to love a plant-based diet. And it's important, too, to start small. Um, and to and to grow to build on 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 the accomplishments you have. There's um, a movement called Meatless Monday uh, that advocates for just one day a week taking meat out of your diet. Um, you can start one day. You can build it up. Um, I know people who kind of do it the opposite, uh, so they have only one day a week where they eat meat, uh, or even just challenging yourself um, a few meals a week, or to replace some of those higher intensive uh, protein sources with a, a lower climate intensive protein source. So again, it's all about what is your motivation um, and how you plan to do it. The third thing I want to talk about is really um, probably one of the I don't know if I want to say the easiest because it is the challenge, but one of the kind of the most important things for us to do, and maybe it should have been first, the first and foremost, we need to reduce for, uh, food waste. And some of these statistics, uh, and I'm sure, you know, Bill and Julie might talk a lot more about this as well. Some of these really kind of blow me away. Um, globally, we waste more than a quarter of the food we produce. And in the United States, that number is closer to 30, 40% of the food that we produce. So right there, there's a huge environmental impact for food that never gets to anybody's table. Um, if food waste for a country, it's so impactful this waste, that if food waste for a country, it would be the third largest emitter of greenhouse gases that would fall right behind the United States and China. Um, food waste makes up 22% of municipal solid waste. So we're looking at not just the emissions related to the land use change and to transporting and storing the food, but now also from hauling it away um, and landfilling it. And on average, American families throw out about $1,600 worth of, of food, which is a significant um, value there. So this is a, a known problem and there's um, a, a lot of work being done about it. Um, and the USDA and the EPA have food waste uh, programming and have created this food waste hierarchy uh, where the initial step is source reduction. So if we can reduce the sources of waste at the, you know, at the fields and at the stores and at our homes, um, then that can kind of reduce demand for food in the first place and reduce uh, production. Beyond that, we need to feed hungry people. Um, and that's something we're gonna hear more about tonight. Um, but we have a food waste problem in this country, but we also have a food access and a hunger problem. Uh, and so it's that connection between the food that we have and the people who need it. Um, from there, feeding animals. I worked at a, a nature center many years ago and we'd get shipments in of past peak produce to, to feed to the animals. Um, and then when you do have food that needs to be, uh, to, to ne needs to be disposed of, thinking about the best ways to do that, uh, composting, so turning it into something else that can be used um, before incineration or landfill. So what are the things we need to do in order to be able to, to waste less food? Uh, it starts as, at an individual level um, with better planning. So all of us, I'm sure, certainly me, uh, can be, um, 
you know, at fault for forgetting something that's in our fridge or buying too much food or just not feeling like cooking this night. And then the food that I bought for that meal ends up not getting used. Um, so better planning, doing maybe smaller, more frequent shops to the grocery store, uh, shopping with a list so you don't overbuy, or even something as simple as meal planning uh, and, uh, and meal prep uh, so that you don't as often run into that, you know, it's, it's Wednesday night and I have uh, a meeting that's late and now I don't feel like cooking. <laughs> so, so having things really prepared um, so that you can, can use that food and not waste it just because plans changed or um, you get tired. So better planning is helpful. Uh, your freezer is your friend uh, is another one. It's amazing how much you can freeze. So if you cook too much and don't want to eat the same thing all week and you have leftovers, you can put it in your freezer. You can put dairy in your freezer. You can put uh, vegetables that are just about to, to pass their prime in the freezer and use them later for soups, for, um, uh, for stocks. Um, so, you know, you can kind of stop the clock and throw it in the freezer and, and use that. Um, expiration dates. Uh, there, I think, are a lot of uh, policy proposals out there to change the regulations on expiration dates. They tend to be best by or sell by dates, not necessarily at that date. Suddenly the food is no good. And so there's a lot of food waste that happens um, because of food being thrown away because of expiration dates. Uh, I'm not advocating that you, you know, get into your hurricane box from five years ago, but um, uh, but thinking about that as well. And embracing ugly produce. Uh, a lot of food is wasted even in the field because it doesn't look like what consumers want the produce to look like when they buy it at the store. And so um, advocating for asking and purchasing produce that looks uh, maybe not poster perfect uh, is one way to, to reduce waste. Um, one quick anecdote that I have, I uh, served in the Peace Corps in Honduras, and one of my friends served in a community that grew um, eggplants, the long skinny eggplants. And every time I went there, it was great for us because we could collect so many eggplants because the ones that grew too close to the ground and got a curve in them uh, just got tossed to the side because there was no, they couldn't sell them, there was no market for it. Um, and so we, you know, grab a bunch and go make eggplant parmesan or ratatouille. And one of the things that she did as part of her service was uh, do cooking classes and teach recipes that involved eggplant because since it was a product that was kind of brought into the community for them to, to grow, there wasn't really a, um, a cultural use for it in the cuisine in the community. Uh, and so these just kind of went to waste. So we can, you know, we can buy the curved eggplants so the curved eggplants don't rot in the field. Um, when food does need to be thrown away, because there's always going to be something, whether it's just stems and peels or, or something you forgot in the back of the fridge, there are ways to dispose of it which are um, a little bit more uh, productive, I guess. Composting is one thing to do. And uh, very grateful to the Junior League uh, to do a composting workshop with, uh, with us um, last year uh, in the uh, community garden. Um, and if you want more information about composting, all the materials from that workshop are on the city's website on our Composting 101 page. Uh, very simple instructions for a very simple compost and inexpensive compost bin. Um, I use the system at my house and it works wonderfully. Uh, and then I just also want to mention that when food does end up in your in your bins on the curb, uh, that if you live in Palm Beach County, um, if you're a Boca Raton resident or a county resident, uh, your trash does go to the Solid Waste Authority. And the Solid Waste Authority does incinerate trash in their renewable energy plants. So what does end up in your in your curbside bin, at least it does get turned into electricity. And we did a webinar with SWA uh, last month where they gave us a virtual tour of the renewable energy facility and you can find that on the sustainability page as well. And uh, before I wrap up, uh, I just want to say thank you so much to the Junior League for putting this together. Um, I think this is a really interesting topic. I'm certainly still learning a lot about it and adjusting my own diet um, and my family's diet. Um, around this as well. And I think it's, it's always really empowering to think of the ways that we do have as individuals uh, this role to play. Um, and so I just wanna leave with this uh, quote from Michael Pollan, who is a journalist who has written about diet and the environment. 
uh, and food for many, many years. And uh, when asked, you know, of all his years of work, what he learned, he said he could sum it up in seven words. And they are eat food, not too much, mostly plants. Um, so again, I'm Lindsay Verlinda Radka, the sustainability manager. My email is here if you want to reach out to me directly, um, as well as the uh, city website where you can find information about more of our sustainability program. And thank you so much. All right, so I wanted to look real fast to see. So no questions so far, but a lot of thank yous. They liked your presentation. <laughs> All right, so I did post a reminder if anyone had questions in there just to post them in there. But since there are none so far, if, uh, I think we decided Julie was gonna go next, right? That's what, that's what Bill said, so that's what I will do, okay. definitely. So Lindsay, that was a lot of really great information. Thank you, really insightful. And um, one part of my career I did spend doing a program that is no longer in, in effect or in, in happening, but with Florida Power and Light with called Sunshine Energy. And it was um, helping to offset CO2 emissions. And um, it was very interesting. We partnered with the city of Sarasota and there's a big solar array, array out there and they were really forward thinking at the time. This is probably 10, 12 years ago now, but I applaud you for all this work. It's really, really important and at the local level too, because as you said, everything adds up and over time, it definitely does. So um, really interesting and I'll look forward to following what you're doing and so forth. So I mentioned earlier, my role is um, as Vice President for Hunger Relief for United Way of Palm Beach County. And back in 2015, Lori George, who's the president and CEO of United Way of Palm Beach County and Palm Beach County Administrator John Van Artem were talking about the need to um, help eradicate or at least reduce greatly hunger in Palm Beach County. It's shocking the number of people in Palm Beach County who are hungry based on, we always think of ourselves, well, mo most people do anyway, of being a very wealthy county, which we are, but there's also pockets of extreme poverty that are throughout the county and then particularly, of course, in the west part of the county in the Glades, which is so ironic because we have the largest agricultural um, fields and farms and businesses this east of the Mississippi. So um, it's, a, it's a very um, interesting county to do hunger relief work in. I worked in um, Broward County, Miami-Dade, and Martin in my previous role, and now I focus only on Palm Beach County. And one of the reasons that I wanted to take this job when it was open is that this uh, hunger relief plan exists. And it's a 200 page plan that the county put together with the Food Research and Action Center. They're out of Washington, DC. They're the premier anti-hunger and anti-poverty organization in the nation. I've done a lot of work with them over the years and really respect their work and their, their leadership in the hunger arena and poverty, anti-poverty field. They worked with the University of South Carolina and put together this plan. It's on the United Way's website. It's comprised of 10 goals. And within those goals are strategies and objectives and so forth to help reduce hunger and um, relieve hunger in Palm Beach County. A lot of it is centered around public programs. For example, the school food service right now because of COVID is operating under the, they call it grab and go break spot, which is normally the summer uh, program that's free for kids to bridge that gap all their meals all summer long. But because of COVID and because of all the different uh, challenges with school being in and children doing uh, distance learning and so on, they, the USDA has extended the uh, grab and go break spot all year until at least the end of the year. Of course, we don't have a crystal ball. We don't know how long that'll go, but that's all free nutritious food. Um, they have uh, lots of requirements around that because it is a federal program. However, and I'm trying to tie this into the whole sustainability piece too, as I tell you about our work, they do allow sharing tables and so forth. So if a child doesn't like bananas or whatever it might be, they can put that food item on the sharing table and the other children can have um, access to that. So that's one um, part of the work that we do. We, part, we partner very uh, closely with Palm Beach County School District. We have five work groups within the Hunger Relief Plan 
that work on implementing the plan. As I said, it's it's 200 pages long and it is um, chock full of ways that we can help reduce hunger in Palm Beach County. Before COVID, we had had uh, we had gotten down the food insecure residents to 162,000. Um, when I got when they started the plan, I got here about two and a half years ago. But prior to that, we, they started working on it. And we keep go, kept going with it, and had gotten it down from 200,000 people to 162, 163, which was a big thing. It doesn't sound like a lot, but in hunger relief, that that's a pretty large chunk. But of course, with COVID, it has now gone up to about. Uh, 300,000 people who are food insecure because of job loss, because of them finding themselves in a situation they've never been in before. So we've been working, um, I should back up a little bit on the on the plan and give you the, the basis and then I'll talk about the way that I, we can relate to the food recovery. We're working with local farmers, we're working with um, our, as, as Bill is, a food pantry and the food banks and so forth to do food recovery and get those um, more nutritious foods out to support people in the community, but also do nutrition education and help them uh, get access to purchasing more fresh fruits and vegetables in addition to what they get through the pantries. But really quickly, back to our plan, it's focused on, we have five different work groups. One is childhood, that's chaired by Erica Whitfield, a, a school board member with Palm Beach County School District, or the School District of Palm Beach County. And then we have uh, the seniors a hunger relief work group chaired by Nancy Yarnell at the Air Agency on Aging. We have an infrastructure work group chaired by Kate Magro at Palm Beach Atlantic University. A, the Glades work group, which is chaired by Caroline Villanueva of Florida Crystals, and I should say co chaired, and also with Melissa McKinley, Palm Beach County Commissioner. And lastly, we have a SNAP outreach, which is food stamps and um, advocacy work group advocating to make sure these programs don't get cut and that we're taking care of our citizens the best that we can from the policy point of view. And that's chaired by Nancy Bolton, an assistant county administrator. Her boss, of course, is Virginia. And um, at any rate, we focus on what's part of that hunger relief plan. And some of the work that we do, again, it's all related to seniors, children, the Glades, um, infrastructure, how that works, and then the SNAP outreach and advocacy. So basically, we focus on the whole county and all of our residents to make sure that they're not, that we're reducing their food level of food insecurity. So um, again, we work on the programs that our government also helps fund so that we can use other funds in the community for other things. So one with the school is, as I kind of talked about already, that grab and go program, which is generally during the summer, there's an after school meals program. The kids get supper and a snack before they go home at the end of the day, you know, in a perfect world before COVID. And now uh, the school district is providing the grab and go meals and the after school supper and snack for parents to come pick up. There's over hundred locations in uh, Palm Beach County School District that parents can do that. We created during COVID a food finder map so that, um, and you can visit that, I'll put the link up after I'm done speaking. Um, you can visit that on United Way of Palm Beach County Hunger Relief's page on our website. And it shows a laundry list of food pantries, the school locations to pick up food, where there's food distributions, where uh, moms with children zero to four can get formula, baby food, diapers, et cetera, restaurants that are open that also deliver, groceries that are being distributed and so forth. We partner um, quite a bit also with the Healthier Neighbors or Healthier Together groups and are doing some pilots around SNAP outreach, the food stamp outreach, which also includes where they're accepted, fresh access bugs, which is a program that people using SNAP or food stamps can use the fresh access bugs and purchase up to uh, double the amount of fresh fruits and vegetables up to $20 each time they're shopping. So the beautiful thing about that is that they can use that in person. They can also use that um, online. And there's some uh, pilots with Walmart and also with Amazon that the usage, I believe, in the state of Florida is 150,000, 153,000 people have used the online purchases. And of course, with SNAP, um, we have about give or take, give or, around 200,000 people that participate in SNAP, which is a public-private partnership. It's a very big, important part of business and the economy and that it helps people spend their dollars hopefully wisely in the grocery store and there's requirements around nutrition and so forth. And then it also is a big part of the business of 
the, the big box stores like Publix, Wayne Dixie, or Aldi, but then also some of the neighborhood stores. So it, it, it helps drive the, econ the economic engine, but it also helps people have access to more affordable food. Bill's going to talk about it in a little bit, but um, the food banks and the food pantries do a lot of food rescue, and they work with the different grocery stores, they work with Costco, they work with USDA, and so on, and the farmers, and bring in food so that it is not going out um, and being wasted. During the first part of COVID, they didn't have the uh, outlets through the, the usual things like theme in Florida, theme parks, the uh, cruise industry, the school district, et cetera. So a lot of that food, they didn't, they, they plowed it under because they could not afford to lose any more money to hire people to go um, basically rescue those crops in the field and get them out. However, we are working with a group called United Farmers Alliance in Palm Beach County. It's a group of about 40 farmers or nonprofit, and they are working to rescue food and get it to our food pantries in and around the county. They are, um, I know they've gotten some things to build at uh, both the Helping Hands, which is pretty interesting because they do hydro farm, par hydroponic farming and are also partnering with farmers that are, you know, they'll talk about it a little bit more too, but uh, I, I learned a lot on the call with them. It's bean sprouts that are highly fortified and the way that they're growing that crop helps the vitamin content and the food value is increases. Bill probably can, can tell us that because I can't remember exactly, but it's many times full over uh, increase of many times over what the normal amount is, and so that helps with less um, food production and more nutrition into our communities. Part of our hunger relief plan too is we work with it's called the Healthy Corner Store Project, and we work with our. Um, corner stores that are in food deserts, particularly uh, in the west part of the county, in the Glades, and Canal Point right now, and South Bay, on helping them access fresh fruits and vegetables through farmers and being able to sell that to the people in those communities so they don't have to drive 10, 15 miles to get fresh fruits and vegetables. And they can buy them, again, through their SNAP benefits if they need to, and also uh, accessing the fresh access cuts. We are partnering with American Heart Association on that, University of Florida IFAS, and several other organizations to help with nutrition education, get the recipes that go with that, those fresh fruits and vegetables, et cetera. And then we also have a um, partnership with the school district doing school gardens, and that's also with schools in the Glades where they grow the mostly uh, vegetables, a little bit of fruit, but mostly vegetables, and then have a farmer's market twice a year where they learn about the business aspect, but also the growth aspect, and they partner with the farmers. Um, I think it was, I think it was Lindsay that talked about some of the crops that are not um, grade A that they really don't look as pretty as some of the other things as well. So um, we also work with the healthy corner stores on adding a little bit of that in there too to see how that's going into the communities and, and how, that, how well that's received. And so far it's been pretty good. Um, however, with COVID, again, it's a little bit reduced because of people being afraid to go out. So we're working on marketing and improving that. And with the school gardens, the same thing. Um, that was really very robust until COVID and now we've got that on pause to the beginning of the year so we can kind of see how it shakes out with the schools doing up and down and so on. Um, I know Bill will talk a quite, a, quite a bit about food rescue and who their partnerships are. Both the Healthy Hands is probably one of the best uh, food pantries in the county. We rely on them to serve South County and other, I guess, parts that they can sometimes. I'm not sure what your exact boundaries are, but we're going to talk about that. Um, we've also been working through the hunger relief plan and the work that we do. And it's a collective impact, we've said, with all the partners on making sure that our seniors are fed. So many of them um, lost their jobs if they had jobs before COVID or are shut in because of the disease. So we worked very, or the virus, we worked very closely with AAA. Um, Area Agency on Aging and the Bowman Center, which is in your part of the county, and then Department of Senior Services in Palm Beach County, which covers more of the northern part of the county, to make sure that the seniors are getting appealing, nutritious food, to Lindsay's point that they're not wasting. So we were able to take a thousand seniors that were on the wait list for meals off the wait list during COVID, big silver lining, but we had funding too from feds, um, and get them off that list. And, with, and 
put together a partnership with 2Js and Jack School EC Trucking to get that food out into those communities. So um, working really um, closely on that and seeing a big, big difference there. Um, we've seen a, almost 160% increase in those senior meals served during the time with COVID. So of course our big concern then is that no one has a crystal ball, how long will this last and how long will funding last? Because we want to make sure we're still continuing to take care of people. Um, the Palm Beach County too, the actual um, Palm Beach County Commission itself, uh, through CARES dollars, have funded food boxes to the school systems that are fresh, uh, healthy fruits and vegetables. And they just implemented a really um, impactful program that they say they're getting really positive feedback on where they're adding fresh fruits and vegetables to those grab and go meals for families to take home. And um, they had a huge, um, great response, which I thought was really interesting to cherry tomatoes. They love that. And they also had a week where they did pineapple. And so the kids and families are getting exposed to more healthy foods, they're getting recipes, et cetera. So I feel like I could talk and keep going and going and I'm looking at the time and thinking I should let Bill have a few minutes. But lastly, we work really uh, closely with a lot of um, providers and nonprofits that provide healthy, uh, fresh food and menus so that we can complement and bridge gaps where the school district is unable to get further into the communities and provide food. And um, during COVID, there's been a lot of restaurants that have stepped up and are getting fresh and healthy meals out into the community and delivered to people who otherwise wouldn't have access to those. So I will end on that note and let Bill talk about how all, it, how all of this works with the food pantry and their food recovery and food disbursement, but that is an extremely important part of relieving hunger in Palm Beach County. It's much more effective than folks waiting in line with the cars and I cringe. Um, I'm sure Lindsay does too with the emissions of the cars waiting in line and people's time and, and also it might not be perhaps the most nutritious that you could probably get through other avenues. So thanks for the opportunity and I look forward to question and answer later on. All right, great job, Julie. And uh, thank you again for your support and your leadership in uh, hunger relief in Palm Beach County. Uh, so Boca Helping Hands is a 501c3 not-for-profit. We're located in Boca Raton. We're entering our 23rd year serving all of Palm Beach County. Uh, we expanded our services over the years to include now seven job training programs uh, where we're taking uh, hopefully people who are on our food rolls and uh, retooling them uh, for uh, uh, jobs that are actually being, um, people are being hired for, hospitality or uh, computer training. Uh, we have uh, uh, CDL uh, training people to drive tractor trailers. And all of these uh, are, in, at least in this particular area of the country, are, are hiring. So we are, you know, home health aid to help with our aging and things. Uh, so uh, job training programs have been huge for us. Um, job mentoring, uh, financial education, and assistance, medical and dental services, and of course, food. Food's always been our core, it's been our focus, uh, and it continues to be our focus today. Uh, food recovery is just a, it's a term that you probably haven't heard a lot about, but it really came into being in the, um, in the 1990s. Uh, there was a, um, a, a law that was passed, it was called the Bill Emerson Good Samaritan Act, um, the Good Samaritan Food Donation Act, and it was passed in 1998. And basically it says that, um, that stores and restaurants, um, as long as they are uh, uh, producing food, like cooking food or um, having food pulled off the shelves uh, near the sell-by date, but it's still in good condition and it has been stored properly, refrigerated, frozen, whatever uh, was necessary for the food, and it was given in good faith, uh, to a food pantry or a food bank, uh, then the liability would go away uh, for, for that person who uh, was uh, donating the food. Uh, and that was a huge step. In 2008, uh, Florida actually came out with a statute called the Jack Davis Florida Restaurant Lending and Helping Hand Act. Again, that was really huge in helping us um, get with food partners in the community and uh, share this with them and say, look, you know, you can really help impact uh, hunger in our area and, and really not be held liable. So we're taking responsibility for the food that we're picking up at restaurants and um, grocery stores. 
uh, food markets and whatnot. Um, and, and we are um, carrying it properly in refrigerated trucks. Uh, we are storing it properly and we are seeing to it that it gets into the hands of people who need it the most. Uh, in 2015, the EPA estimated that over 39 million pounds of food waste was generated annually in the United States. Lindsay kind of made reference to that in her presentation, and it's, it's appalling. It truly is that there's so much food out there um, that we are wasting. Um, uh, and, and so what we're trying to do is we're trying to rescue that food or recover that food uh, rather than it being thrown into um, the incinerator at Solid Waste Authority. So where does this food come from? Well, we pick up uh, food from retail stores, nine public stores in the Boca Raton area, uh, three Winn-Dixie's, uh, a Walmart, uh, three Targets, Whole Foods, Trader Joe's, uh, Fresh Market, Costco. Uh, but we also pick up from restaurants, so Capitol Grill, Grand Lux Cafe, Seasons 52, Cheesecake Factory, Bonefish Grill, Out Outback Steakhouse, Chick-fil-A, um, Flakowitz, uh, we get bagels from Flakowitz, Little Caesars and Papa John's. These are restaurants in the uh, Boca Raton area that we uh, are recovering food from. Um, and it is really great, these partnerships that we have uh, forged. Uh, Capital Grill, we have been picking up food from them for over 10 years. They, they make their own, they butcher their own steaks. And so we get the beef trimmings and our volunteer cooks can actually uh, chop that up and they can make uh, like a really good meatloaf or they can make a beef stew or something really creative um, out of this leftover high quality beef um, from Capitol Grill. Um, and it, it's really um, interesting how much food that we pick up from some of these restaurants that has to be frozen uh, because it wasn't served. Um, and as long as it's served and stored properly, it's going to get into the mouth or in the tummy of a, of a family. Uh, whether it's served here uh, in our hot meal program or if it goes uh, in a frozen package home with them to be uh, to be served later. So uh, what we've been able to do from this food, um, you know, apart from the obvious of saving it from being in landfills or being incinerated, we have been able to serve over 650,000 hot meals um, since uh, since 2005. Uh, roughly 80,000 homebound meals have been served. So we've been able to help shut-ins. Uh, over a half a million sandwiches to go, mostly for those unsure of where their next meal is gonna come from. So when we have a, a hot meal that we serve, we give a sandwich uh, for someone who uh, later on in the day uh, can use that for some nourishment. Uh, over 600,000 pantry bags uh, filled with wholesome nutritious food plus frozen meat, uh, fresh produce, eggs, dairy. Uh, we've been able to um, uh, send home uh, with families in Palm Beach County. Uh, with this abundance of food, we've been able to expand our food distribution locations. We started out uh, with just our main location in Boca Raton um, 23 years ago. And then we, uh, about 10 years ago, we started distributing on Saturday mornings in West Boca at the Boca Glades Baptist Church. Uh, they've been kind enough, uh, uh, kind enough to allow us to use their parking lot to help distribute food to families in the Sandalfoot area in West Boca. Um, another a little bit of a, a food insecure hotspot. So we've been out there for a little over 10 years. Um, and we also have been able to um, uh, distribute in Boynton Beach uh, at the First Baptist Church of Boynton Beach. Four days a week we're up there. Uh, and we're impacting um, upwards of... Uh, 80 families a day uh, that we're uh, serving in the Boynton Beach area. And quite recently in, um, uh, in June, we opened up a spot at the Advent Lantana on uh, Lantana Road, the Advent Church. And we're doing that on Saturday afternoons from one to three and we're impacting upwards of 100 families there uh, on a weekly basis. So we've been able to take all of this food that we're uh, able to recover or uh, rescue, and we've been able to put it into the hands of the families that need it the most. Now, what can you do to help? Well, these are your marching orders, okay? And we've already heard the fact that you can reduce your own source waste. Uh, and I, I really like the fact of using, um, I'm a list person, so I like the fact of using a shopping list. And I think I'm going to maybe do that more so, uh, so that I don't have those impulse buys and buy too much food and just actually go out and get the food that I need. 
Uh, but yeah, uh, after you do that, encourage donations of unserved or unsold or edible food from any restaurants you frequent or grocery stores where you shop. Uh, go into your local Publix and find out, you know, if you, you know, if it, talk to the manager, are you donating your, um, your fresh produce uh, that isn't sellable or, or your frozen meat that is uh, past its, or uh, getting close to its sell by date? Are you donating that to a local food pantry? Um, and you will find many that are doing it um, through the feed, through Feeding America, uh, and then in local um, in South Florida, Feeding South Florida, part of the Feeding America network, gives us these stores. So we're actually doing these under contract through Feeding South Florida, Feeding America. So Publix may not say Boca Helping Hands is getting my food, but they'll say yes, we are donating to Feeding America. Uh, but out of the, uh, let's see, I pick up from nine public stores in the Boca Raton area. I believe there's about 18 in the entire Boca Raton, West Boca area. So there's a lot of stores out there. I'm not sure if they're all donating to um, food pantries or not. So check with your local uh, grocery store and find out if they are in fact uh, contributing food to this cause. Um, another way that you can help out is you can volunteer. You can get in the story. And the Junior League of Boca Raton is excellent at that. We have had uh, a partnership with the Junior League for several years um, where they have had um, people, uh, Junior Leaguers coming in and helping out, not just at our food distributions, but also in our warehouse and in our um, weekend food programs. Uh, they've been helping us. So you can actually volunteer, you can get in the story. We're always looking for able-bodied individuals to help with uh, transporting of food from local restaurants um, or maybe the processing of food in our uh, warehouse, uh, the storing of the food and helping to prepare the food in our kitchen um, or perhaps helping at one of our distribution points. Um, but th the main thing is get involved and, and understand um, you know, the impact that, that we're making here in the community whether it be at the food bank level or at the uh, food pantry level. There's over 100 food pantries in Palm Beach County. Um, so you can get involved somewhere and you can help uh, make an impact in your community. Uh, just to kind of give you some numbers as far as uh, what um, food recovery has been like for us over the years. Um, in, in 2010, we recovered 323,973 pounds of food. That sounds like a lot, okay, but that was 10 years ago, almost 324,000 pounds of food. We have surpassed that annual number four out of the nine months of operation this year. Okay, so uh, this month alone is going to be probably about 325,000 pounds of food recovered and distributed um, to um, needy families in our county. So um, we have a fleet of three refrigerated trucks, three cargo vans, um, and we do expect to recover and distribute uh, 3 million pounds of food this year for the first time in our history. And again, that's a collective, um, uh, it, it, it's, it's a group of people, whether it be the um, people with uh, United Way and Hunger Relief, or whether it's with the food banks like Palm Beach County Food Bank, or uh, Feeding South Florida, or the local uh, restaurants, or the uh, local grocery stores, uh, or the farmers markets, uh, it's, a it's a collective where we're all working together to try to reduce the waste and then to take this food that is edible, it may not be the best looking produce uh, as Lindsay alluded to, but it's edible. And you know what, you may get a, a bruised apple you, you can cut around, or you, know, you may get you know, some celery with some brown leaves uh, that you can just act, you know, cut off and, and cut it down to, to really the freshest part of the stock that you're going to eat anyway. Um, but it's, it's not, appetizing in the store so it gets pulled off the shelf and hopefully it gets put into a food pantry somewhere that we can uh, pass it on to others. So that's in a nutshell food recovery and that's what we do here at Boca Helping Hands. We love doing it. We have a passion for helping people and we'd like to have uh, everyone that's watching this get involved, partner with us um, and uh, go to our website uh, bocahelpinghands.org. Check out ways that you can get involved uh, with um, uh, donating food, uh, food drives, or uh, volunteering with us in helping people in our community. All right. 
Thank you guys for your awesome presentations. I think you must have blown them all away because I still don't have any questions, but all the participants are still here. I can see them. So they must have just loved it. I'm just getting a lot of thank yous and everything was so wonderful. Um, I guess I'll just end with this. If anyone does think of any questions, um, after the fact, you're welcome to email the garden JLBR um, email, which is just garden at jlbr.org. Um, and if I can't answer it, then happy to get it to either of our three panelists um, and they can, you know, help point you in the right direction. So I'm happy to do that if anyone thinks of anything after the fact. Um, but we really appreciate your guys' time this evening. I know I learned a lot. Um, so I really appreciate it and uh, thank you very much. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much for having us. Yes, thank you. It's great to be with everybody. You guys too. I hope everyone has a great night. You too. Good night. Bye-bye.